Now let's take a look at this and see what every little nugget in here that God has. Verse 18 says this, and to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, the son of what? Underline that, note that, highlight that. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But this is the only time that we find in the book of Revelation and one of the few times in the whole New Testament, son of God. He often refers to himself as the son of man. Why? Because he's the representation of all humanity and took it to the cross to die for our sins. But here he's not speaking about his reputation or his representation. He is speaking about his authority. Right. The son of God who has the eyes like the flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze say this. Now, we've been studying these churches long enough to know that there is a pattern, isn't there? Every single church, when God introduces himself, he introduces himself in a way that's got some kind of connection to that church. So remember just the last one that we saw in Pergamum, because they had the big library, he introduced himself as the word. They were all about wisdom. And he says, I am wisdom. I am the word. I am God. And so there was that connection that he made. All right. So here he says, I am the son of God. But then he uses a description we found in chapter one. Remember chapter one, he used the same thing about the eyes of fire and the feet of bronze, right? So what do we know? We now know that there is something we need to pay attention to. There is going to be two different things, a special connection, and there's always going to be two things given to every church. A word of what and a word of what? A word of commendation and a word of condemnation. So we're going to be looking for these because we find this in every one of these letters. So let's check this out and what is being said to us. So first of all, Let's look at the description. He uses, first of all, the eyes of fire. Now, if you remember when I thought about this in chapter one, it was real easy for all of us because growing up, almost all of us endured this. It was called mom. Mom usually had that gift where she didn't even have to say the words. The eyes did it all. <coughs> the eyes of fire, eyes representing the penetrating. You know, your mom would say, where were you? And you knew she knew. <coughs> Just that penetrating looking through. And so the eyes representing per, the penetrating and then fire purifying. That this refining fire that God is looking and gazing upon, but he will refine and he will give you this clarity. He's going to look straight through at you. Now, why is that important for you and I to know? I want you all to know this. Look at the scripture right here. Look what it says in Hebrews. And there is no creature hidden from his what? sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You see, what is the Bible telling me? The Bible is telling me very, very clearly that God does what? God sees everything. You see, brothers, I need to tell you straight up. The Lord sees how you treat your wife during the week. He knows exactly how you respond. He knows the rage. He knows to this. He knows all this kind of stuff and the demanding. He knows that at church, it's God bless you, brother, and how you doing, and so on and so forth. And then when you at home, it's just like, rah, 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 rah. God sees. He knows. Ladies, he knows where there is honor and dishonor going on and bashing the husband and all the disrespect that goes on in the context as, as the enemy just tries to pick and destroy and cause us to question one another. Where and how did we fall in love in the first place? These years ago, what has the enemy tried to come and kill, still and destroy? Hey, he knows what you're watching. He knows what you're saying. He knows the jokes that we're listening to, that we're laughing. He knows when we're talking, when we should be. He knows when we're silent, when we shouldn't be. And so we need to understand that it's not some cosmic cop, but a holy, loving God that says, as a surgeon looks and does the studies, he's looking for the cancer because the cancer kills. Amen. And so he says, my eyes are afire because I want to see, to define, to purify. The point is, here's the key. Just like the medical doctors today you got to go get the MRI. Then when the MRI comes back, the doctor reads the report, and then who has to agree to the surgery? You do. Now, as I said on the New Year's Eve sermon, all you got to do is get on the table. Surgeon does the rest. There's not a single one of us that woke up in the middle of our surgery and said, let me help you with that. <laughs> I mean, right here, if you did a little slice here, and then a little, no. And yet we come back all the time with God and say, Lord, let me help you with that. You're not doing it right, Lord. Let me, let me help you with it. You haven't done it quick enough, Lord. I've been praying about this for three years now for crying out loud. No. 
Lord is at work doing his work in and of and through each of our lives. So we first recognize God is identifying himself with these eyes that are purifying fire, meaning he's looking at what's wrong for the reason to make it right. Amen. Amen. Secondly, feet of bronze. What are feet representing? Mobilization. I'm moving around right now. And so there is this mobility, this feet of bronze. Bronze is the metal of what? Judgment. Maybe the brazen altar, bronze, it is the metal of judgment. And so there is this movement towards judgment. Now, when you hear the word judgment, what's the first thing? Come on, let's be honest. What's the, how's the first reaction in you is what? Kind of get, yeah. But remember, judges are not always pointing out what's wrong. They're also pointing out what's going right, unless you're Simon Cowell. But other than that... <laughs> The judges will say, hey, I really like that. I like this. This you could work a little bit more on. Are you following me? And so we need to have that right answer, that right mindset of what is going on. Now, the point we are going to see in this sermon this morning that this church, Thyatira, was doing something. Look with me in the text. It says that she, that they were tolerating a woman who brought false teaching, false theology. And this false teaching and wrong theology was leading people astray. My point, Thyatira, the smallest of all the churches, if you paid attention, it's the longest letter. Of the seven churches, it's the longest one. It's the smallest city. What's the point? We can have big problems in small places. Just in our own homes and just in our own community, we can have big problems in small places. So let's look at this small place. Thyatira was a commercial city, as I said, famous for its purple. It's dye for purple. How do we even know that? There was a lady in Acts chapter 16 by the name of Lydia. Lydia was from where? Thyatira. Wow, you guys are rocket scientists. There you go. And so Lydia from Thyatira, the exporter of purples, okay? And so there she was. She was an exporter of this dye. Now, the reference son of God, as I said, the only time it's used here. Why? Because Thyatira is known for two things. This city had not only its crop that was very well known for its dyeing and its exporting of this, but it had a temple of a fortune teller. And so fortune telling, going there to seek wisdom and, and foreknowledge was a very big pilgrimage in there. And so there was this temple with this great high priestess in there, and there was a temple to Apollo. If you know your Greek mythology, Apollo was the son of whom? Zeus. And so there they had the son of God, Apollo, the sun God, and God is addressing saying, ah, uh, the real G-O-D is speaking right now. And so the son of God is coming to share with you a truth that is necessary for you to hear. So that is why he describes himself in direct contrast to them and references this mindset of foreknowledge. Now, verse 19, he goes on after his intro, he says this to this church, I know your deeds. And your love and your faith and your perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. See, Jesus commends them for five things. Number one, he commends them of their good works. He says, hey, I, I know your deeds here. And of these things, what are these good works? And he says, well, notice they had love. They served one another. They had faith and they were patient. And so here's this church that they've got good things going on. They get together and they had love. They had love for one another. They served one another. They were involved in their community doing things. They had faith. They believed that God was large and in charge and that he was on the throne. And they had perseverance, patience with one another and what was going on. Remember, these were not easy times to be a Christian as persecution was beginning to rouse in Rome over those who believed in the way. And so he says, this is the amazing things. And not only that they had love, service, faith, and patience, but it was growing. It was growing. Now remember, the Thyatira Christians, as they continued, their faith and servanthood was growing the very opposite of Ephesus. They did less as they went on. This church did more. However, there is a hint here. He references these things with an insinuation that this church was depending on upon their works. Now think with me. What makes you this morning think you are born again? 
What makes you believe you are in right standing with God? What is it that you feel has validated your existence as a born again child of God? Is your dependence on good works that you love people, you're serving others, you're involved in our cockle ministry and doing things and going down there, that you've got faith, that you believe that there is a God who's large and in charge, and you're very patient, good, and kind. You know, I am a dot, dot, dot. And so, yeah, man, I am right inside there. You see, my question to us this morning is, this warning came to this church that he says, hey, I love all this about you. I love this. But what does the very next verse begin with? Verse 20, first word. But, but I have this, what's that next word against you that you, and that word is please circle, underline, highlight, tolerate that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things, sacrifice to idols, involve themselves in activity and actions that are along the pagan lines rather than the sanctified lines. You see, he blesses them for five things. But then right here in verse 20, he rebukes them for five things. Please note these and jot them down. Number one, they tolerated false teaching. There was false teaching going along. They didn't themselves embrace it. They themselves did not even proclaim it, but they tolerated what was going on around them. Secondly, they tolerated and indulged in the immorality. Again, we'll talk more about that immorality and what that really was and what that looks like and what that means. But nonetheless, things were going on around them that was not Pono and they did nothing about it. The next thing that God, not Waxer, not One Love, not the church, God rebukes this church for is that they, they then participated in idol worship. What did that idol worship mean? Well, folks had icons. They had little statues around. They had these other things. They were seeking others who had some form of spiritual knowledge and wisdom and insight above themselves. Translation, idol worship went to someone to get a fortune, went to someone to get some insight into their life rather than directly going to God, idol worship. Then number four, they refused to repent, which we will see in 21 and 22, and that they were also involved in the depths of Satan, which we will talk about more later. So we see these five things, five blessings that he says, but hey, I am very concerned about these five other things. So the key word, the key insight for us to understand this rebuke that God gives to this church in Thyatira is the word tolerate. Tolerate. And this is a difficult part of the difficult sermon that I share with you guys in the beginning. That means that this church knew what was going on around them was wrong and they said nothing. They did nothing. Church What they prized was harmony, peace, living a quiet life, being left alone and so leaving others alone. You see, we have a problem here. God, not me, rebukes the longest rebuke to the smallest church of the seven churches that even represent seven epochs in church history to a church that was living right, striving right, going after right, but leaving the world to go to hell. Amen. And God says, that ain't me. Do you know, some of you might be new to the faith. You might not be that well-versed in your Bible. Did you know that the Bible even says to know what's right and not to do it is sin? Take a look right there. James, therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is what? Sin. Okay, so this again isn't me trying to put trips on us. It's if you see a neighbor going off on his child and you do nothing about it because it's none of your business, time out. I just showed you that according to the Bible, it is. No child should be beat. 
No wife, no spouse should be beat. No one should be allowing just the carnality of the world going around. Am I saying that we are the cosmic cops of the planet? Absolutely not. Am I saying it's my kuleana to stick my nose in everybody's everything? Absolutely not. But when God clearly burdens your heart that you see something going on, whether it's in the media, whether it's going on at the Capitol, whether it's going on in the politics, on the whatever it is, it's going on in your school, in your workplace, and it is not right, and you say nothing, Bible warns you. Amen. The Bible warns me. You see, the key word is tolerate. Tolerate what? Jezebel. Amen. What is Jezebel? Well, Jezebel is not the person Jezebel, but you know, she has been dead for years. Jezebel, just like Egypt became an idiomatic description of bondage, Jezebel represents many things. The spirit of Jezebel, and I will speak about that this morning so we'll have a better understanding of it. But the first direct initiative contact was there was a woman whose name was Sambathe. Sambathe was the woman who was the oracle in charge of the fortune telling. She was the biggest known person in this temple. And look at me, please. Sambathe had a conversion experience conversion experience she had someone sharing the gospel with her she responded to it in such a way and so apparently had gotten saved and immediately was put in a position in the church to start teaching same thing happens today for some reason we just love the celebrity status and when a celebrity gets saved, immediately we just start putting them on platforms, put a mic in their hand, and the brother or the sister has not yet walked in any sense of transformation of fruit in their life. Probably the most famous, the most well-known for any of you that are my age is Bob Dylan. Keith Green shares his faith with him. Bob wants what he sees in Keith, prays to receive Jesus Christ, comes out with an album called Saved and has these songs inside there that have some pretty powerful lyrics. But after a year, Bob was back to doing Bob's thing because he invited Jesus into his life rather than surrendering his life to Jesus. Amen. And you see, there's the difference. And so now Sambathe, she is in there, and they've given her the pulpit because, hey, it's going to make our church popular. Hey, this person's coming to town. They're teaching. Yeah, I know there's some things that we don't necessarily agree with, but people are coming. It's going to make us popular. This person's really well-liked, really well-known. So let's just not look at what we disagree. Let's just find what we can agree. And that was going on in this church. And Jesus says, ah. Ole. No. You see, we saw this in the New Testament with Simon. The Bible says that Simon believed. Peter spoke and Simon believed. And yet later he asked to buy the power of the Holy Spirit because he was a magician. And so he's like, wow, that must be a good trick. I'd like that one too. The Bible tells us that Simon... Because of his disregard for absolute surrender to Jesus Christ, he later became known as the father of the Gnostic movement, a cultic teaching that has led many people astray. You see, Simon believed, but hear me now, but he was not a born-again believer. Amen. Now, let me just say that clearly to all of us. Simon believed, but he was not a born-again believer. I am not asking you this morning if you believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you if you believe that there's a God in heaven, that even God created it. I'm not even asking you if you believe that he died on a cross and rose again. You see, sadly, prayerfully, no one in this room, but quite possibly somebody in this room, definitely somebody watching on TV and somebody listening on the radio is going to miss heaven and spend eternity in hell by 18 inches. Amen. Right here. 18 inches. Intellectually, you have come to recognize who Jesus Christ is as God. But you have yet to surrender your heart yes. to him. You can agree with everything I'm saying today theologically, as Simon did. As Sambathe made a proclamation of faith in the word that she heard. But what she did is she just added that to her mixed bag. Rather than saying, I surrender what? All. All. You see, family, theologically, mentally, intellectually, 
you're no different than the, than the demons of hell. Because James 2.19, you say you believe in God, so do the demons and shudder. So if believing in God makes me a Christian, well, then Satan's a Christian. It's not just putting the belief. It's to surrender to his lordship in your life. That's what a new born again person looks like. Amen? Amen. The transformation in your heart. And so we say this in love. James said your heart must be touched. Your faith must affect the way you live. He put it this way. Faith without works is what? It's dead. Now, wait a minute. You're saying, wait, wait. I thought you just said earlier in the sermon that faith in Jesus Christ, our salvation that we have, it comes by faith. Yes, faith that works. You see, you have to, and I'm not telling you faith and works. I'm not telling you faith or works. I'm telling you faith that works. That there is a transformation in your life that you not do to get. There is doing coming out of your life because something already happened. There is a lordship in your life that God has changed you. But you see, Sambathe was not a true prophet. How do I know that? How can I have the gall to say that? By her fruit. The Bible was rebuking her because of her false teaching. And just like Simon and his teaching of Gnosticism. See, the name Jezebel, I mean, I want you to put this down in your notes, is given not only to represent her actions, the very Jezebel who was leading the nation astray. But Jezebel's spirit also goes to connotate this, a theme or an attitude of those actions. You see, what do I mean by that? A theme or an attitude. You see, Ahab was her husband and Ahab knew what she was doing was wrong. And yet he remained silent. That's part of the story of Jezebel. That this tolerance of evil because at the ends justifies the means. He was the king. At the end of the day, he got more power. So, hey, what the heck? If at the ends justifies the means that people leave me alone, I just get to live my quiet life, so on and so forth, then it's all okay. So now, now comes the tough part for me. What I'm about to share in this next section is not going to make me popular with some. And I just want to say this in love. That's okay. Because Jesus did not ask me to make friends, but to make disciples. Amen. And so as you wrestle in your heart with me, do so via scripture, not tradition that you grew up with. And not that from something you learn from someone you love very much, but take all things to the word of God. Amen. But what is Jezebel spirit? You hear it thrown around in circles a lot. Let me summarize it. Because there's, there's a little bit of, yes, jealousy is a part of the Jezebel spirit because it's not, I'm not getting what I want and, and I disagree with this and so the world isn't complaining to mine. So there's this idolatry of self, this idolatry of this, all these different things. Let me just simplify it. Take a look right here. Any teaching, leadership, or action that seduces God's people away from what? Yeah. Him is an act of Jezebel. Right. Any teaching, leadership, or action that seduces people away from him is an act of Jezebel. That is what this church is going to show us and help us to understand where God was rebuking this church's tolerance of a Jezebel spirit. Now again, key things here, any teaching, leadership, or action that ultimately will lead us away from where? From him, from him. And so now this is where, and just leave that slide up there for a bit. This is where it's going to get tough. Because you have to hear my heart this morning. I am not blasting an entire group. I am not blasting every single person that would maybe be involved in this. I am saying there are some things that I have serious concern about for some folks who represent this. But for some of my brothers and sisters in what is known as a Pentecostal movement, there seems to be so often a higher emphasis on the manifestation than the manifested one. Amen. On the gifts rather than the giver. The healings rather than the healer. And so we want to come to this service because the experiences that might happen. And so the whole thing about just being so overwhelmed by the spirit of God that I was knocked unconscious, that I fell on the floor just laughing uncontrollably, whatever it might be that the spirit came. And so people go to these references for this very experience of the action. Notice any teaching, leadership, or 
action that causes the emphasis away from Jesus Christ is a spirit of Jezebel. Now stick with me. John 14, John 15, do your homework. You go back and you listen when we went to the study. The whole job that Jesus, not this church, not this pastor, that Jesus said of the Holy Spirit was to draw people's attention to? Jesus. To Jesus. Not a feeling. Amen. And everyone says, and the feeling will set you free. <laughs> and everyone says that I have come that you might have this incredible, overwhelming coziness. No. no. In this world, there is tribulation. You see, folks, when we come to this mindset of seeking manifestations and experiences, or the other part that begins to happen in these circles is that there's this inner knowledge. There's this inner depth. There's this maturity that once you kind of get in, then you're going to have this experience. And someone is sitting in this room right now going, dude, I had that experience. I, I went through that. Are you saying that what I did was fake or bogus? No, I'm not telling you at all that what you had encountered or the family or the church that you grew up in, in and of itself was fake or bogus. What I'm saying is, is that the purpose of God's church is to lead us to his word, his will, and way. in his way, in his way. And so what is the drive of your focus of coming into God's house for an experience? Or is it, as David said, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord? You see, is there there's this inner, deeper insight? I got to tell you that sometimes some of my friends, and I love them to death, but there is a pride, there is an arrogance that, well, if you knew what I knew, then you would also walk in this way. And you see, this is something to be concerned about. What about the fact that the teachings are that there is some anointing out there that needs to be sought after and caught and then brought back to the area. This is nothing new. It goes all the way back to New Testament times. It was in our times, this very great movement in Toronto and so everyone was running up to Toronto to get this blessing. Then it was Kansas City. Now it's in Redding, California at Bethel. You got to run out there and do your little pilgrimage and grab whatever this stuff so you can come back. Family, read your Bible. Listen to me. Signs and wonders follow the believers. The believers don't follow signs and wonders. God was working in Samaria just like he was working in Jerusalem. God was in both. The city of the rejected and the city of the sanctified, the Holy Spirit fell on him. Just ask Philip and the incredible ministry that God was giving him out there. Amen? You see, when I hear things referenced as new wine... Well, they're referencing an intoxication. An intoxication. The Bible tells me to be sober in all things. The Bible tells me that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. See, listen to me, please. When I'm saying these things are not found in the Bible, as in saying it's non-biblical, it's extra-biblical, do not hear me saying it's anti-biblical. What I am saying is that there's enough that is in the 66 books that I'm having a hard enough time following as it is. But one thing I know, my job is to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. What is the kingdom of God? Jesus, he says, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. He says that. He steps right on the stage. Here I am, the king. This, and forgive me, but this thirst for slain in the spirit... The only slain in the spirit I see in the Bible is Ananias and Sapphira. They drop dead. And whenever you see someone in the Bible overwhelmed by the presence of God, which way did they fall? Talk to me, brother. Forwards. Not on their butt. Forward in absolute reverence. Oh, did not David say, I will not give to the Lord something that did not cost me anything? So if I'm knocked out flat on my alcohol, how am I bringing something to the Lord? How is that worship? Now, in your quiet time at home, can you be just overwhelmed by his blessing? Yes. Are we to just rest in his presence? Yes. Are we to be still and know that he's God? Yes. Are all of my quiet times on my knees? No, sometimes they're flat on my alcohol. In my bed, just going, thank you, Lord. Or on my floor, just prostrate, face down, whichever way. I can just say, Lord, here am I. Speak to me. But I'm talking about what we do when we gather together in the house of the Lord. Do we eagerly desire 
the gifts, you see the gifts that it says in Philippians, excuse me, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, earnestly desire the gifts. This isn't the experiences, this isn't the manifestation. He's talking about the gift of help, the gift of teaching, the gift of evangelism, the encouragement. Go down in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. Look at the gifts that God is offering, and every single one of you has them. Do you hunger for that? But you see, are you looking for an experience, or are you looking for your Savior? Amen? Amen. I want us this year, as our, our theme this year, as Father, guide us to direct, to live in 2014, what is foreseen? What is foreseen? What is your word, will, and I want to walk in that, God. And so, what is it? And so, I acknowledge every morning, God, thank you for your presence. And whatever the phone says that day, I will say, I trust you, Jesus. See, the angel family rebukes this church for not doing or saying anything about what was going on around them that was drawing people away from Jesus. Not a happy thing to do. Not a popular thing to do. But I think we need to ask ourselves this morning, what are we worshiping? Peace and harmony or God? Amen? Amen. Now notice what he says to them in verse 21. And I gave her time to repent. These that were leading people astray in one form or another. Because good things can check out of God's will. Did you hear me on that? Good things, busyness, Martha, all this can check out of God's will. And I gave her time to repent, and she did not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. Or it says her deeds, which means that you are in harmony with this Jezebel spirit. One thing you got to keep in mind, this word fornication or adultery that you have in there does not exclusively mean physical interaction. In the Bible, it often refers to what? Spiritual. A spiritual idolatry, meaning that which you seek to worship. Well, how can I answer that which I worship? Pretty easily. That what you think about most, that's your God. That what you're most afraid of losing this morning, that's your God. So if you've been concerned about your, in, your, 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 your income, your resources, your family, all these other different things, you see, all of a sudden the Lord begins to say, where is the idolatry? Where is something that is placing the emphasis rather than saying, Lord, they're your family, it's your house, it's your job, you begin the work you're faithful to complete it. I am scared to death, but I know you're not. Amen. God wants both. He wants our faith. He wants our honesty. He wants us to come to him just as we are. You know, I thought it was very interesting that the churches of Ephesus and Thyatira were the exact opposite on their commendation and their condemnation. Did you notice that? In Ephesus, they were weak on love, but they discerned and judged false teachers. In Thyatira, they were strong in their love, but they were way too tolerant on false teachers. Isn't that the funny thing? Isn't that basically the church today? We're struggling. We either got, it's all hellfire and damnation, and people don't want to go there and go, you know, Sainer, you know. <laughs> this lifestyle is this, and then they come out and blast, and you're like, whoa, holy smokes. You know, so they're just weak on the love. They're like porcupines. They got a lot of fine points, but no one can embrace them. You know, just Or it's the other side, it's just like. <laughs> Let's all just come and get along. Because God wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise, and happy. And... Let me just write another book about that. <laughs> Both of these churches emphasized wrong things, and what was the same conclusion they needed to do? Repent. 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 Look what it says in 2 Peter 3. Look overhead. The Lord is not slow about his promise. Some of you are thinking, God doesn't care about what's been going on in your life. Mm, he's not slow, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burnt up. You see, the Bible is saying here that sin is a type of cancer and you don't tolerate it. <clears throat> you leave cancer in your body, even if it's in your pinky, it will eventually kill you. And so sin is sin and we need to get rid of it. And so for that reason, mm, 
Church discipline is a very critical and necessary thing. I say that looking down because it's not an easy thing to do. There's not a pastor worth his salt that says, oh, goody, church discipline time. In fact, I think too often churches have ran to discipline before discipling. When you see somebody who's struggling on something, instead of coming at them, why don't we come alongside them and put our armor on them? Take them to coffee and say, hey, some things that I've seen going on that I, I have a hard time reconciling with what Scripture says. What about you and I talk about this? Because maybe someone just never let them know. So there's going to be times of discipline. Listen, the Bible tells me in Hebrews 12, Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, Proverbs 7, these scriptures tell me very clearly that God disciplines because he loves. His eyes of penetrating fire are to look what's wrong because he wants to make it right. He wants to sear with his incredible laser gifting that which is cancerous and that which is going to destroy you and me and the world around us. And if we do not discipline those within the church, then some of them in the church are going to find themselves here on planet earth during the tribulation that's what the verse just said it says for those who will not they will fill with the pestilence and all the disease that's killing everyone else during the tribulation verse 23 and i will kill her children with the pestilence and the churches will know that i am he who searches the mind of the hearts and will give to each one of you according to your what Come on, according to your what? To your deeds. You know that word deeds is used 17 times in Revelation alone? Deeds. And you know what? Deeds has a reflection and implication and application for every one of us in this room, whether you are born again or not. There's an application for the Christian and the non-Christian. Let's first look at the non-Christian. The Bible says we can be judged according to our deeds. And here's what I want you to see. Keep your finger here, but go with me now to chapter 20. Just go all the way to the end of this book. Chapter 20, and I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne, and the books, notice plural, were opened. And another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. Now notice this. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown where? Okay, the Bible just says there are two books, basically. Book of life. And the book of deeds, them books, exactly, because for some of us, it's taken volumes. It's like an encyclopedia Britannica, (laughs) the books, got the book and the books. Now notice, it just says, if you want to be judged by your deeds, awesome. But guess where you're going to end? Book of fire, hell, again, idiomatic of separation from total God. Absolute separation of God is hell. Don't try to argue with me about a place, a this, a that, a condition. Absence of God, because God is love, joy, peace, face, and to the absence of all that, that's called hell. No God, no that. And so he says, there's not a one of us in this room perfect. And you see, I'm glad you're a good person, but heaven isn't a good place for good people. It's a perfect place for perfect people. And only perfect people get to go. Not fair. Nobody's perfect. (laughs) Welcome to church. (laughs) That's what we've been saying for the beginning. Only Jesus is perfect. And he's the one that forgave me. But now, if you are a Christian here this morning, I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 3.10 as well. 1 Corinthians 3.10. I'm glad you know that your sin is forgiven. But according to 1 Corinthians 3.10, Rabbi Paul gives us a warning. It starts off very strong. According to the grace of God. Hallelujah. That should be underlined. According to the grace of God. Any sentence that starts off like that is going to be a good sentence. 
According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. He's telling him, I brought you the word, now you're getting discipled by new teachers and mentors. But let each man be careful how they build upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is what? Jesus Christ is the only foundation, folks. Is there anything else, a spirit, a manifestation? Someone asks you, when, when did you? No, come on. Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds upon a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed. How? With fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each person's work. If one's work which has been built upon it remains, they will receive a reward. If one's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but they themselves shall be saved, yet as though through what? Fire. I'm just going to ask you a question. Are you going to be in eternity the entire time smelling like you just came from a barbecue? <laughs> a campfire? You just got in by the skin of your teeth. Because Jesus died on a cross and you asked for him to forgive you. Hallelujah. But what is that manifestation, that evidence, that fruit in your life that you walked in the fullness of all that God wanted for you? See, we don't do to get. Doing is because we got. We got the Holy Spirit. See, who draws us to a conviction of sin? The Holy Spirit. And so if a church is filled with the Holy Spirit, it's going to draw folks to a conviction of sin. This church in Thyatira had all these neat things, but it wasn't a spirit-filled, spirit-led church because it wasn't willing to call sin a sin. And God was saying, I can have no part with that. And in our own lives, is there a hunger and thirst for righteousness? You see, he has a zeal here, a promise for those who are walking with him. Look at this in verse 24, back in 224. But I say this to the rest of you in Thyatira who don't hold to this teaching. Hey, just because some in this church are doing this, I know that's not all of you. Big warning for us, I will bring in a moment. Those who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Now, what is this phrase, deep things of Satan? It's very interesting. The Gnostics and the other cults had a very common phrase at those times, knowing the deep things of God. They knew the deeper things of God. You know, you know, oftentimes you'll find people from certain movements and they'll say, you know, this whole, well, if you studied what I studied or if you had gone to this place. And so we have this inner and deeper knowledge, as I referred to earlier. Right here, he's calling it out. So much so that he's saying the deep things of Satan. Because anything that leads you away from Jesus is not God. So good things can check out of God's will. And so he says, listen, this whole secret knowledge thing, Solomon said it best. There is nothing new where? Under the sun. Hey, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. But I'm going to say in love this morning, please, there are some here who have loved so much a part of our church, but there's still a spirit inside you that is saying, you know, if they only knew this, if they could only experience this, then this church could be from here and it could go here. And beloved, I'm just going to tell you in all love, it's not out of ignorance that this shepherd doesn't go there. Amen. This dog has been in that barn and smelt every corner yes. and lapped it twice and have said what God has called us to do in this church is to teach the word and equip the saints. Amen. And that's why I focus on that. That is why that is the emphasis of my life is to draw all things and all people to Jesus Christ. I simply ask for those who hunger for some experience, some overwhelming manifestation, some overwhelming whatever, I ask you this simple question, why is the word of God not enough for you? Because it changed the world upside right in AD 70. The word of God working through the people of God, living in the love of God. Amen? Amen? You see, it's very prevalent today. If you only knew what I knew, well, I know what I need to know, and it's not a what, it's a who, and it's Jesus Christ. 
He says, nevertheless, verse 25, hold fast until I come. Chapter four, we will see, starts with meta tauta, meaning after these things, after these things, what comes the rapture, the tribulation. So most likely he's referencing to these guys. Hey, I know you're in the midst of a kapakahi world. Hang tight. I'm coming for you as in contrast for those who are the non-repentant. But let's finish this here. Verse 26. And he who overcomes... And he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken in pieces. As I also received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What does Jesus promise here to those who are faithful? He offers them two things. He, number one, authority to rule the nations. That in that millennial kingdom, we will come and rule and reign with him. But even sweeter than that, he offers to give us the morning star. Now, what is the morning star? Well, first of all, let's understand that it's idiomatic. These were people who did not look at television to find out what the weather was going to like. They looked where? Up. It wasn't what does Guy Hoggy have to say. It's what does the sky have to say. Okay, so they got in the morning and looked up. Now, Venus, which you always know, is that strong star that you see there. And so... It became idiomatic of the bright and morning star was that which was the first thing that draws attention, that first thing of importance or preeminence. So understand that it is even used in the Bible in a negative reference. I know there's probably cults that have come to your door and try to confuse you and saying the morning star and the Bible is translated wrong and you need this version rather than this version because the, the, the. Stop it. <laughs> stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. It's an idiom. So yes, it spoke about Nebuchadnezzar thinking that he was all that, that he was the bright and morning star, that Lucifer thought he was the bright and morning star, that he was all that. And so for that reason, it was a reference to his arrogance and pride. Here in the reference that he will give us the bright and morning star, who is it referencing? Jesus. Because what has he been telling us in the beginning? Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of? If that's not enough for you, look overhead. Look what it says in chapter 22 of this book, verse 16. I, who? Jesus. have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David, the... Right am I a scholar or am I a scholar? Huh? There it is. <laughs> it's right there in the book. Interpret scripture with scripture, family. What are some closing comments? Number one, understand this, family. It is sobering to realize that we can be doing so many things right and still be heading down the wrong path. You can be doing so many things right, but be still heading down the wrong path. In these politically correct times where the teaching around us is that all paths will lead to Rome, all paths have their former, or let's just water down Christianity, let's not make it offensive, let's not use the word repent because someone might get upset. And beloved, in any sermon of God, if you were not offended somewhere, you were not paying attention. Because the gospel is offensive. Because we're not God. And so I always want to go a little bit that way, and God wants me to go this way. And this church in Thyatira, what we learn of church history is they, they begin to claim that the teaching of their church was superior to the teaching of the word. They begin to say, you don't need to read the Bible because you'll get it wrong, so we will do it for you. We will teach the word. We will tell you what it means. We will tell you, just trust the church, and the church will give you the direction. And so for that reason, you need to learn a couple things this morning. Would you like to learn how to discern, to recognize false prophets? Yeah. Let me give you three things real quickly. Number one, you test the character. You see some guy on TV, somebody says, hey, I read this book by so-and-so. Number one, test the character. Look for the fruit of the Spirit in this person's life. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Self-control, yeah, self-control. Like, how many homes do they have? <laughs> Boats, jets, this and that, so forth. Self-control. Self humility. What kind of humility does this person have? And my favorite one, accountability. Amen. To whom do they answer on this earth? Well, I answer to the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. Then you're not obeying the Bible. Because Ephesians 5.21 says, be subject one to another. Pride is like bad breath. Everyone knows you have it but you. And you need that person. Second thing we're to do is to test their creed. 
Ask for a statement of faith or go online and look for it. What do they teach about Jesus? Who is Jesus and what is salvation? How was one saved? How do blessings come? By planting your seed faith? We accept credit cards. <laughs> and then really important number three, test the converts. The converts, the fruit of that ministry. What kind of fruits? How long? Have you ever noticed any of you guys that have been Christians long enough, you recognize that all these, whether it's Toronto, whether it's Kansas City, notice they're there for, and then they just stop. Peter's out, and then there's something else, and then, then Peter's out, and then, then, then there's always a new dog with a new trick. It's the fruit. To whom, listen to me, to whom and what are the people committed? That's the first sign. To whom and what are they committed to? Do they come out talking about how awesome the pastor is or how awesome the Holy Spirit's working there, how awesome this or that? Are they talking about Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior? What are we to do? We're to watch these three things. In our own life, we need to do four things. First of all, we need to look into his eyes. Those eyes of penetrating fire. Not only our works, Again, saved, we're saved by faith, that works. The manifestation, yes, it's there. We're not supposed to be sitting on our hiney. We are to come unto God and say, Lord, open my eyes to look into your eyes. What are the things in my life? Where is the compromise? Where am I worshiping peace and quiet more than your word, will, and way? Do I care that people are going to hell around me? Number two, then do not tolerate what he shows you. Do not excuse it away. Well, you know, I know I'm not supposed to gossip, but it just happens. I know I'm supposed to love my mother-in-law more, but, you know. <clears throat> Number three, repent. Repent. Yes. It's not my words, it's his words. It's in the text. And number four, then we were told in this text to hold fast. Those that are walking, those that are striving after righteousness, there's not a one of us in here that is righteous. No, not one. But hold fast as we go through. Family, we live in tough, tough, tough times of political correctness. Seems like every single week there's somebody on the news, if it's not Uncle Phil, it's some politician, it's some somebody who said something and the whole world in an upcry until they apologize because someone was offended. But I want to show you a verse that the Bible says says this in 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Not a very popular verse, but it is the word of God. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial, okay, the devil? And what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols, for we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Jesus is not saying, as I said earlier, that we just stay in our four corner no more, go to church meetings and church people with church gatherings and church things and get our milk from a Christian cow. That's not what he's saying. We are to be salt and light. But where is your partnership? Where are the influences in your life? That which you are around the most will influence you most. That which you are watching most will influence you most. And so we really need to ask ourselves this morning, where are we? Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now. Change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you but you got to ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I want to lead you right now in a prayer. 
that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. And today, I come home. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area. Get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple, as the Bible says, because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.